All right, hello, wine drinking people. We are back, and that's right, folks. I did so much drinking yesterday. We're on for a third show today. But hey, I figured this was important enough. When you got Augustin Huneus Jr., he doesn't have Jr. on the card, though. Kind of interesting when you when someone with the same name as you that you follow and lineage, same, you usually put Jr. on the card. But, anyways, big shoes to fill. Both his mom and dad, famous people in the wine industry. And uh, August did a great job last night speaking. It's hard to capture the attention of 30 people in a room that's somewhat loud, even though I have to say the room at Trina was empty the whole time that Augustine was speaking, which was great because it's a large room, but when you're the only people in it, really did work out really well. Looking forward to doing more events on the beach with Chef Mark and with Tom there. Uh, some, some great food last night. Even though it was a little light on the food, hey, it wasn't dinner, it was a tasting. A couple of people mentioned it was a little light on the food, and it's uh, supposed to leave you just uh, with a little bit to eat and still hungry so you stay for another appetizer or something else. But anyways, thanks everyone for coming last night. I think the wines showed excellently. And uh, the Adrian Gale Chardonnay, as Augustine pointed out, this is on the true Sonoma Coast. The reason why these guys bought this vineyard, there's a huge appellation, the southern the Sonoma Coast, which reaches all the way into the Russian River Valley. And it was created somewhat ambiguously. And uh, this winery is out there right on the coast in the extreme growing conditions a great area for pinot noir and chardonnay and they make more burgundian style wines here because it's colder here you don't see a lot of stuff coming out of this area 15 percent alcohol and not that you're going to mistake these wines for burgundy because this adrian gale chardonnay we had last night had that lovely tropical fruit that you get in california but yet had wonderful acidity also just a nice hint of oak spice as well a really well-balanced wine that had a lovely long finish uh, really, really nice stuff. That's what we had at the bar during the pass-arounds. And then we sat down, and uh, we tried a little bit of the 09 Illumination. This is a Sauvignon Blanc that was inspired by people like Didier Dagano, people that are pushing the envelope of Sauvignon Blanc out there today. And Augustine said they actually did go and visit with uh, Didier while he was still alive. He passed away a few years ago. And one of the things that they took from this visit is the way they ferment their Sauvignon Blanc. They do it in large oval concrete fermenters. Well, you can ferment in wood, you can ferment in stainless steel, but one of the things that concrete does is help to hold the temperature and it is porous. It allows the introduction of a little bit of oxygen. This tends to create a little richer wine and uh, this wine definitely fairly rich. And one of the people asks, uh, how long do you think this wine will last? And I guess it's at least two or three years. Man, this wine will last 10 years to me. It had wonderful structure and the de definition of minerality is that impression that you get on your tongue after that you swallow the bottle, swallow the wine. It's almost like acidity gives you that freshness, but it leaves that tingling on your tongue, and you, you notice the minerality at the end. And this wine has got a ton of it. Some lovely melon, fig, and white grapefruit citrus on there. Very Bordeaux-like, and uh, as I mentioned before, very rich, long finish. I think it's one of those wines you, you definitely want to set aside for a little while just to see how it ages. Okay, next up, we had the... Um, Quintessa. We had three black wines that make up Quintessa. This is a rather large vineyard, and it was purchased in 1989. This property uh, was one of the last huge properties in Napa that you could purchase. If you if you started your winery in Napa in the 60s and 70s, like Mondavi and some other large people at that time, you could actually get a huge 500-acre property. But this was the last one that was there. And it was owned by a famous restaurateur from San Francisco. When he passed away, um, uh, his two sons uh, actually well, they didn't really like each other. Uh, uh, inherited the property and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately it was in escrow 14 times before the Hineases bought it and it was kind of a joke you know when, when they said that they had a contract on it everyone's like oh okay well great the Camus has tried to but you know the, the people Camus tried to buy it the Mondavis tried to buy it all these people have tried to buy it and finally it fell into their hands and when Augustine's mom said I'm going to farm this I'm going to start this vineyard because there was never anything planned on this property biodynamically at that time people just looked at her and laughed well that's very fashionable today but it really is an amazing property the rest of Napa Valley is flat and then right when you come upon the Quintessa Ranch there's a lot of kind of little hills and valleys in there so they have a lot of different exposures in this property and they have like 20 different blocks we just had three of them last night the first one was the bench block and this is a block that had a lot 
of tannin, uh, a pretty good structure, but it was all pretty much in the front of your mouth. And uh, a lot of red berry, uh, blackberry, black cassis fruit on this, a little bit of dusty tannin in there. But again, this was uh, what created kind of the front palate of Quintessa. Then we had the Mount Calis wine. Uh, this is, has more white soils. They've got several different soil types also in the Quintessa property. And uh, this is uh, uh, what kind of creates the uh, back of the palate here. Uh, you'd really notice this wine after you swallow it, the tannins and the structure, but not a lot of fruit, uh, not as much fruit in the front. And then the Dragon's Terrace. This wine to me had the best note, and this was what really lingered on the middle of your palate. So it was really neat to try these three different separate blocks because you saw how they created the front, the middle, and the palate of the Quintessa wine. They only use about 40% of the juice in a good vintage, 40 to 50 percent. The rest of it they sell off in bulk. I asked the guest who they sell it to, but by law they can't tell anybody. Um, and uh, the 2006 and then the 2007 vintage of Quintessa followed uh, both of these outstanding wines. The 2006 much more forward and drinkable. This is a wine that's about elegance and finesse. It's never got big scores in the Wine Spectator, but that's because James Suckling does not understand elegance and finesse. He just understands wines that hit him over the head with oak and with ripe, succulent fruit. And hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone's got something different that they like, but I'm happy that Quintessa is a wine that we've developed a lot of fans for, and that uh, if it got 99 points in the scores in the Wine Spectator, it wouldn't be still $100 a bottle, which sounds expensive to some people, but hey, there's wines that cost 10 times the price that to me are not any better. All right, we had the prisoner to end the evening, and uh, you know how I feel about Zinfandel, but hey, when you put a little Cabernet Sauvignon in it, man, you can really make a decent wine out of this. This is the newest acquisition from the Augustine Vintners, and a uh, really nice little wine and a real crowd pleaser, and it, this is when it hits you over the head. It's like 15.5% alcohol. All right, folks, well, that's what I had to drink last night. I'm your host, Andrew Lampasone, signing off for the Wine Watch, saying, remember, always drink the good stuff first.